next week, and we're going to end this year more than a few minutes early. I'll put the times in the, in the email that I send out, but we'll probably start like what time? Uh, yeah. 35 and we'll get out around 9 10 or so. So adjust your uh, the rest of your Sunday schedules accordingly, please. Huh? What is that? Nepal Air Force One. So she wants three chickens. You're sitting in Steve's seat, so you got to take his place. Exactly. I have instructions. <laughs> Morning, welcome. Thank everybody for coming. It's not easy coming the week after Purim. People were worried about my uh, voice after Purim, rightfully so. So I figured it's just a couple days after Purim. Maybe next week we'll start uh, Shirim Halakhas about Pesach. But uh, I figured for today, time in between, we could go back and deal with, we've done already. I think this is the third in the series of profiling a posik to have a halakhic appreciation of one of the big poskim in halakha. This year we've profiled Rav Henkin, who was a big posik here in America. We profiled Ravaji Yosef. And this week I like to profile the third Godel. Now the way I went about choosing this person is well Hankin was we call a classic Litvish American Posik, Ashkenazi Posik. Ravavadya is clearly Svardic. So we got the Litvishas, we got the Svardishas. So I thought it was only right that we get a Hasidic posik to be third in the series. So we have Shmuel Vosner, who was only Nifter a few years ago, 2015, uh, was somebody that was a tremendous, tremendous posik. Uh, and I think he gives us a glimpse into the Hasidic world of Psak. And that's why I want to profile him today. Now, firstly, the subtitle is called A Glimpse into the World of Hasidic Psak. But I spent a lot of time going through many, many of Rosner's tshuvas, anything, any stories I get my hand on, whatever I could find. And my conclusion is, a posik is a posik. For the most part, there isn't really a difference between Ashkenazic, Sephardic, Hasidic. For the most part, he's deciding the law based on the letter of the law, the halacha that dates all the way back, halacha of Moshe Misenai, Armasora, and a lot, you know, you could be Hasidic, you could be Litvish, you could be Sephardic, a lot is the same. There are some differences, or maybe some themes, that we could uh, focus on today and highlight. For the most part, to understand that all posts really are the same. They have to have a tremendous understanding, a tremendous bekeas and halacha, a tremendous connection to halacha, and that's what a posik is. I think in today's personality of Wozner is being the fact he's probably, I would say to the audience here, less known than the other two people we profiled. Ravad Yosef was world renowned, especially in the Sephardic world. Ravad Yosef was somebody that literally lifted up the entire 
Sephardic community. Rav Henkin, those who go way back, know that he was the first POSIC here in America before Moshe Feinstein. He was the address in the Lower East Side that people went to. So you deal with two pers personalities that I think people are connected with. Rav Osner, for the most part, was an Israeli POSIC. <coughs> So he does have children that live in Muncie, in Bar Park, that have a hashpa, and people in the Hasidic community know of them. But for the most part, I would assume our audience doesn't know much. And I'd like to spend a little bit more time today on the background, the biological background of Arvosna, to first get an appreciation of who he was, and then to delve into his psakalacha his authoritative halakhic positions. So let's begin. So Shmuel Vosner was born in Vienna in 1913. Being the fact he passed away in 2015, that leaves him 102 years old. Quite amazing. Baruch Hashem Arichas In fact, I'll show you in a moment perhaps how he was zochet to live for so long. He grew up seemingly a simple home. <coughs> Don't believe that his father was a big rav, big posik unto himself. I saw a clip of a video where the current Bubba Varebi, at least of uh, 45th Street in Borough Park, is talking, inspiring his chasidim, what it means to work and learning. And he mentioned as a praise this Ravosner was not born in Eloy. He wasn't born a genius. You know, many people think these Rabbanim, some of these great rabbis, you know, Avadji Yosef was known for his photographic memory. Never forgot a detail. Knew everything backwards and forwards. A lot of great rabbis were absolutely brilliant. Ravosner was not born a genius. But nevertheless, he attained tremendous levels of learning, of scholarship, based on his effort he invested. He worked and he worked and he worked and he reviewed all the Gemara, the halacha that he learned, and he became a great, great person. So where did he learn? Where did he grow up? So he went to the famed yeshiva started by Rav Meir Shapiro, who was, we'll see, the most famous for starting the program of Daf Yomi of learning one page of Gemara every day, this Rav Meir Shapiro started the yeshiva, which really was a first of its kind in Europe. Most of the yeshivas back then in Europe was a simple yeshiva building. There was no cafeteria, there was no food services in the yeshiva, there was no dormitory in the yeshiva. The boys at the dorm, at the board by people in the community's houses. They had to eat many times by other community members, keg, not exactly, many times not so respectable. Many of them, many of them uh, different times suffered from malnutrition. And these were issues that were dealt with Really, the whole yeshiva life, you know, nowadays we look at a yeshiva, multi-million dollar business with, you know, dormitories and food and everything. You know, the bunker just has to come, roll out of bed in the dormitory, come to yeshiva and sit and learn. Everything is set up, excuse the pun, kishulchan aras. The table's fully set. But in the world... Back in Europe, to be yeshiva buffer means perseverance, means you didn't eat, and it was, it was challenging. Rav Meir Shapiro was the first of the people to realize that if you really want to get the masses to come to yeshiva, you have to make a better environment. He bought a building, which unfortunately built the building, which the Nazis took over in World War II. His building was a huge yeshiva building, which had room for a base medrash, had dormitory room for the entire yeshiva, which was quite big. 
It had food services, including a fresh bakery. Every day for the boys, they baked fresh cake, fresh cookies, <laughs> bread, whatever they wanted. Boys wanted to come to the yeshiva, but he was a smart businessman of Mayor Shapiro. It wasn't easy to get into his yeshiva. Do you know what the fahir, the test to get into the yeshiva was? You had to know 200 block Gemara, 200 pages of Gemara, which needs to say is multiple Masechtas. But also, the fahir wasn't just simply on Baba Kama, Baba Metziah. It was on Kachin, the most intricate, unfortunately not practical yet, uh, halachas, that's what you fahered on. So this boy, young boy, Shmuel Vosner, took a fahered. He studied, he tried, he took his test, and unfortunately they told him when he finished his test, I'm sorry there's no room for you in the yeshiva. AKA, there's a nice way of saying, you didn't pass the test. You didn't pass the fahered. And what was amazing about this boy, even this young boy, okay, I didn't make it in. What can I do? With equanimity, he went to the local shul. Can't get in. I'm going to have to travel back home. I guess in the meantime, I'll go sit and learn in the local shul. I can't sit and learn in the yeshiva. I wasn't accepted. So he goes and sits and learn in the local shul. The way Hashem works these things out. Who came to Davin Mincha in the local shul? None other than the Rosh Hashiva of Meir Shapiro. And he sees a nice bacher sitting there learning. He asked him, what are you doing here? He said, I came to take a fahir in the yeshiva and I didn't get accepted. Her Mayor Shapiro was impressed of this, the genuineness, the eagerness of this boy. He didn't get accepted, but he's still sitting in the local show learning. He said, I'm going to get you into the yeshiva. After all, it's my yeshiva. <laughs> Shmuel Vosner gets into the yeshiva and the rest is history. He became one of the closest Talmidim of Rameer Shapiro. So much so that when Rameer Shapiro passed away, the yeshiva sent Rishmuel Vosner to deliver the Hespedim all over Europe. He was the one who gave the eulogies all over Europe over his dear departed Rebbe. And he grew in those years in yeshiva to a tremendous Talmud Chacham. And, okay, he, Baruch Hashem got a wonderful shidduch, nice girl in Europe, and then of course, the tides started to turn in Europe. And this is at the beginning of the war years. And he foresaw, he saw what was going on, he says, I have to get out of here. And like many people, you know, they had challenges. You know, within his family, I believe his wife's family didn't want to leave. But he was insistent. He saw the writing on the wall and says, we have to get out of Europe. He boarded a ship by the Haganah to get to Eretz Yisrael, to get to Palestine. This is pre the founding of the state. He gets on this boat wife, many other people, in fact 148 other people 150 people on that boat and they try to pass in port in Israel this is the time of the British blockade they were not letting ships into Israel and they tried, they went from port to port and nobody would accept them this went on for two months, this boat was going and going and going trying to get in, trying for someone to have compassion and uh, open the doors and it didn't happen. To the extent the, the picture the scene it's so archaic but maybe not so in our times but they're trying to get in it doesn't work, it's going on for two months the captain of the ship makes an announcement, we have no more fuel we're not going to make it back we can't make it back to Europe they're not letting us in. 
they were miles away from the coast of Israel. They're like, we're not going to make it. And the captain of the ship advised everybody, if you want to survive, you should swim ashore. Of the 150 people that were on that boat, <coughs> only six of them survived. Two of the people survived with this Rav Shmuel of Osner and his wife. Rav Shmuel of Osner, growing up in Vienna, somehow was a big swimmer. He swam miles ashore with his wife by his side. And that's how he came to the coast of Israel. It was an amazing, amazing story. This is how when the foremost Hasidic poskim arrived in the shores of Israel, he swam there. Just as an aside, for the rest of his life, he was always health conscious and would go swimming all the time. Later in life, his students built for him a private pool in none other than B'nai Brock. That's who we're talking about over here. He arrives in Eretz Yisrael with, with not even the shirt on his back. Quickly is recognized for being a young Tamachacham and was made part in Yerushalayim of the Eda Haredas, the most strict group of Hasidim in Yerushalayim, he was part of their Bezdim. A little while later, upon, upon the advice of, of others, amongst them the Chazanish, he moved to B'nai Brak, and he started a community called Zichron Meir. It's a community within B'nai Brak. In fact, the Chazanish lived in that neighborhood. Zichron Meir was named after his famed Rebbe, Rav Meir Shapiro. He was appointed the head of the community, the rub of the community, and he also opened the yeshiva, Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin, to memorialize the name of his yeshiva that he went to in Europe that was knocked out and destroyed by the Nazis. <coughs> yeah. And in fact, this whole idea of starting a yeshiva after his Rebbe, the story is told, that his Rebbe appeared to him in a dream and begged him that Rameer Shapiro never had biological children. But he said, the two things I fought for in life are my children. One is the Daf Yomi, this study, which in the world today, you know, we're coming up next, this coming January 1st, there's going to be a CM held for the second time in Meadowland Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Last time they had 90,000 people in that stadium. It was bigger than any Jets Giants game. Right? Made the Super Bowl was the only thing that was at a Super Bowl there. But they're renting it out on January 1st. Can you imagine what the weather might be on that day? For 100,000 Orthodox Jews who want to come and celebrate finishing one page of, at a time of the Gemara, the tractate. A program started by the Shemir Shapiro. So obviously, that Dafyomi was still alive, and that has lived. But he said the other thing I produced in life was my yeshiva, the yeshiva Chachmei Lublin. And he asked his star Talmud, the Shemuel Vosner, if he could continue it. And that's what he did. And for the rest of his life, he really carried two hats, pun intended. His black hat and his strimal. He was the Hasidic Rav of the community, but he was also a Rosh Hashiva, the head of a school. In the world today, you don't usually have those, a person with those two roles anymore. Either one or the other. Too big of an institution to, to do two things. But he was so big, so great, that's what he did. And for the many, many years of his life, he was a posek. He put out a sefer called Shal's Tshuva Shevet Halevi. He published 11 volumes of this. Pages and pages and pages of halachic discourses. 
Amazing. After in recent years, he uh, his psukim come up a lot. The Deer Shoe Organization Israel produced this beautiful six volume, you know, set of Mishabura with collections of modern day poskim. And there's a lot of his work which is published throughout the Earthship, something which the American world probably didn't know much of until the advent of that. But he published so much, so much in Halacha. And one more biographical note, because you know, his Rebbe appears in Giant Stadium in uh, the Meadowlands, but he appeared in City Field. Now, Vosna never, I don't know if he ever came to America. I doubt it. His kids were here. I don't know. But in, two, 20, in uh, 2012, there was a famous, some might call it infamous, uh, gathering in City Field. I was there in the overflow crowd in Arthur Ashe U.S. Open Stadium. But that's when they had this internet asifa, this gathering of the Orthodox Torah world to talk about the dangers of technology of the internet. And Vosner spoke live at that event, live via satellite. But, you know, the Jumbotron, which had sports players, at least for some moments, that hosted uh, Vosner, who appeared and spoke and gave over his sock, his views of how a Jewish home should balance on the one hand, business, which in the world today, it's not getting any easier since 2012. It's almost impossible to do a lot of business without internet access. But at the same time, curbing and protecting and filtering what's delivered to one's internet, to one's home. Because there are definitely dangers that even the secular world now has come to uh, realize with the internet. So that I think is a pretty colorful background of this Hasidic Posik who grew up simply in Vienna, didn't at first get accepted to Yeshiva, but eventually became the star Talmud of Ramir Shapiro and lived his life to continue his legacy. Became a big Posik, a big Rav in Bnei Brak. It's a miraculous story how he got to Israel. And we'll see a lot of amazing halakhic ideas. <coughs> so as we begin the halakhic part of the share, I forgot to mention earlier, today's share was sponsored by the Honig family, Leil Nishmas Bevor Abbas Shimshon Shlomo, and Pesel Hadassah Bas Yaakov Cohen. This is Edith, Edith Roth and this is Paula Honig and Shama Shehav and Aliyah. So the first area of halacha I'd like to show from this Ravosnar was the concept of Mesorah, the concept of halachic tradition. In the first tshuva of his third volume, he writes a I'll call halachic response, sort of defending the honor of the Ramah. He writes it that there was, a, seems a modern day rabbi who was proposing that look, we know we have the Shulchan Aruch, right, our code of law. And the Shulchan Aruch was written by the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Cairo there are these little comments on the bottom, right, in Rashi print, in the Shulchan Aruch, that's made by Ramosha Isselis, the Ramah. And if you remember quite clearly by the Ishir when we talked about uh, the Raja Yosef, he was very strong in the contrast that Rabbi Yosef Cairo was a Sephardic Posek and the Sephardim Faral, the Beis Yosef, Maran, and that's who they follow Halacha. While the Ashkenazic world follows the Ramah from Moshe Isselis. So there are some posik, some rabbi, I shouldn't use the word posik, 
who was saying, you know, when the Ramo wrote his, 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 you know, commentary, there were like glosses on the side of his Shulchan Aruch. He didn't really mean that for people to keep for halacha. And he was probably just reflecting like common customs in his time. But if, you know, we have different customs, of course we, we go differently than that. And the Ramo shouldn't be taken too seriously. That's what a, some modern day Rav theorized. So Shmuel Rosner wrote a, a beautiful rejection of such an idea. And you can see the steam coming out from his ears as he writes this. Because that's a very dangerous move. Halacha is something which we have to be very careful. You know, it's the, it's the Masorah, it's tradition of Kalah Yisrael. It's very, how can he do that? Right? He writes very strongly, I thought, a beautiful proof. In the Ramaz times, there was an equally, there was a great Jose called the Marshal. He's in the back of our Gemaras. He wrote a say for Yam Shal Shlomo. The Shla HaKadosh was a student of the Marshal. So here you have these two great people called earlier Achronim, the Ramah and the Marshal, the Yam Shal Shlomo. Two great leaders. The student, the star student of the Marshal who is, this is the Shla, admits that his Rebbe's, I guess you call arch nemesis, his Rebbe's contemporary, the Ramah, is who we follow on Halacha. That means even if you batted for the other team, you still admitted, you know, the other team are the champions. So he says, look, in the times of the Ramah, even his competitors admitted that the halacha should be like him. So how could someone come today and say different than that? Pretty good proof. <clears throat> and he's, he quotes the Chassam Sofer saying, <clears throat> don't you know that the Yisrael were getting close to Pesach? They left Mitzrayim, the Torah says, Biyad Ramah, literally meeting a strong hand. But the Chassam Sofer coined the phrase Biyad Ramah, meaning with the power of the Ramah, <laughs> this Ramosha Israelis. How can we not follow his halacha? And he got some chizuk in his piece, a very interesting line. Towards the end, he says he heard from one of his Rebbeim, he was very close to the Chazonish in Bnei Brak. And the Chazanish told him that unfortunately you see this phenomenon in the world today. That for 400 years, people won't learn Gemara without learning Marsha. So Marsha is a classic commentary on the Tosmas. For 400 years, people won't learn Gemara without a Marsha. And nowadays, you know, people, where's the Rambam? Where's the Reb Chaim? People don't know his Marsha. He says, you see this phenomenon. Sometimes as time goes by, things from early generations, people sort of like challenge or disregard. <coughs> this happens. But we have to stand up against it. Chazanish stood up against that element in learning. And the Vosner stood up against it in Psach Halacha. That's one area. I was I opened up the first volume of Shevet Alevi, and I started reading his introduction. And what does he write about in his introduction? First halachic discussion is about sneers, modesty of in terms of women. In general. I guess if one would categorize what's different about the Hasidic world versus the non-Hasidic world, so it's the form of dress, both in the men and the women. And again, obviously there are people that are exceptions to the world, but in the most part, a very strong tenant of Hasidic Jewry is to be very scrupulous 
in the way that one dresses. Again, I don't know that our audience are any real Hasidim here, but that's really a Hasidic tradition. The first thing he chooses to write about in Zakdama is in his introduction to his Sefer is to be very, very careful about women's dress, very careful about Sneas, right? I'm sure people have seen the signs, whether it's in Israel, or they have them in Williamsburg too. They have I think, <coughs> respectful signs that if you're coming into this establishment, please adhere to the laws of modesty. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it becomes a tourist attraction. People come there. Williamsburg has became, uh, become the, uh, you know, quite a hip city. Everyone knows it's doing over there. And, uh, you know, it's like funny. If I see them on one side of the street and hippies riding their bicycles on the other side of the street. So they have that, you know, respectful signs. You know, there are people that could be unrespectful, but that was another area. Again, I think the same theme of holding on to tradition. He was a posek, a Hasidic posek, who looked very strongly to hold on to tradition. I'll tell you a third area I found. In the middle of your sheets, Kuf Pei Zayin, he has a very interesting tshuva. There's a major difference between, I guess you call a Litvish wedding and a Hasidic wedding. Classic wedding yeah, is the parents the father and mother of the groom and the father and mother of the bride march them down to the chuppah. Right? They march them down the aisle to get to the chuppah. That's what's done in most of our circles. In the Hasidic world, the way it's done is the men with the men and the women with the women. The groom is escorted by his father, but not his mother his future father-in-law. They escort the groom down, and the mother of the Kala, together with her mother-in-law, escort her down. And when Volsner was asked a question, is there room in the Hasidic world to flip it? You know, after all, you know, it, it doesn't say in the details of the tshuva was we're talking about a mixed marriage, a Hasidic with a Litvish, we're not talking about that. That we gave a share earlier this year, Svashkanaz. But he was asked a question from the Hasidic perspective could we have sometime a scenario where we have the, the Hassan's father and mother, the Kala's father and mother, walk them down? And he very goes through the tshuva, he brings proofs from earlier generations. He says, absolutely not. There's no iser, there's no Torah prohibition for a person to walk down to the chuppah with his father and mother. There's absolutely no Torah prohibition. There's no rabbinic prohibition. So why don't we do that? Well, it's a custom that developed within the Hasidic world. And he's able to trace back that custom hundreds and hundreds of years. He says, if that's a custom, then we have to treat that custom to a certain degree, just like any other halacha, and we're going to hold on strict to that. Now, I would think a position like that, you know, I, I, I didn't have a chance to fully research and find it anywhere where Moshe Feinstein was asked such a question. But, you know, in the Litvisha world, I would say there's probably more room to bend. And it's, oh, okay, it's, a, it's only a minog, and the Shalom Bay is involved, and which mother doesn't want to walk her son down to the chuppah? Okay. In the Litvish world, they might be more bending on such a thing, even if a person had a minog. Okay, he had a minog. In front of three people, be mater neder, and uh, march on. Pun intended. But... Here, in the Hasidic world, his position, this is, this is a custom that's gone on for hundreds of years. You can't break it. I'll show you one other interesting thing I just came across last night. I did not grow up on a farm, although 
for some time around here, we had some chickens. I don't know why. What happened? It was a bad perm stump that lasted a few years. <laughs> but anyway, so I don't know anything about raising chickens. But it seems like in the world today, a lot of the chickens are what you call, and uh, this has nothing to do with uh, a green peace plan per se, but a lot of the chickens are hybrids. They're hybrids. They sort of, you know, they genetically, they breed this one or that one to get, you know, a super chicken. Now, I know a little bit about horse racing, right? You have a good horse, you know, so they grab onto those genes of that horse to try to make another super horse, right? If you, if your horse won the Kentucky Derby, you could sell that her horse for lots and lots of money because they expect to get the genes of that horse and something else and make another super breed. So it seems in the chicken business, they do similar things. They try to get the best possible chicken. Yeah, I guess more bang for your buck. <laughs> so, so they figure out exactly, okay, let's get the best genes in that. A Shiloh was asked of a Volsner <laughs> that these chickens are developing. Now, the Torah does give basic uh, characteristics for kashras. On some elements of the birds, there's what we call a masara. There's a tradition. A lot of the birds is not a clear cut. Okay, what is classified as a kosher bird or not a kosher bird? And a Rosa was asked about all these hybrid chickens. And he was saying, I don't know. In Judaism, we're very into a tradition, especially when it comes to kashras, especially when it comes to birds. And you have these chickens, or these hybrids. We don't have a masora and such. And basically, he encouraged his students to go and find pure breed, pure chickens that we could trace back that are not, you know, these hybrids. So his students went checking every farm around the town or beyond the town. And they found some farmer in Belgium. This guy was a believer in not mixed breeding his chickens. He even had written files and notes dating back. You know, it's like the guy you buy a used car from who has like every oil change, you know, receipt for the past 25 years. One of those guys. So this guy had like extensive records of all his chickens, and his chickens are 100% pure breed. These Hasidim bought off like his eggs. They started chicken coops in Israel with this guy's eggs. It was called the Breckel chicken. And they started harvesting these chickens. And it became a thing. Oh, these are purebred chickens. The stomach like shmur matzah, the price was like exorbitant for them, for the business. Meanwhile, the chicken tasted horrible. They looked a little bit weird, but that's what they were doing. I, I can't <laughs> hold back. This is the story. So what's interesting was other poskim, amongst them Moshe Sternbach, who's actually from the Eid of Haredes, but also I found this story on the Star K's website of Moshe Heinemann, pretty major cautious organization here in America, in Baltimore. And they went the other way. They, not only did they, you know, the Hasidim were accepting these as the, as the pure chicken, they said the other way. We have no more services for weird chickens like this. Our chicken tasted good. Our chicken was this. And they wouldn't accept these chickens to be kosher. Talk about Benahapachu. <laughs> Backs you up, huh? So, again, I think the halachic principle that you see here is Rav Wozner as being a posse for Hasidim was very strong on holding on strongly to Masora. And whether it came to a challenge in halacha to the Ramah, Tznius, modesty, walking to the Chuppah, men with men and women with women, 
or this last thing with chicken. Just whatever there was a tradition to, they clung on very strongly. And that's one aspect, I believe, you see in his Piskei Halacha. But the other aspect, which I mentioned before, is really most of what you're going to find in the pages of Esvarim are just like any other posik with Moshe Feinstein, that we dealt with with Henkin, with Ravaj Yosef. Halacha is halacha, fidelity to halacha is fidelity to halacha. I had the chance to speak to a long-time Rav this morning who dealt with many chasidim. Halacha is halacha. Baruch Hashem. I'd like to share some interesting, insightful halachas. We know when it comes to a bris, it's very important for the bris to be done on the eighth day. Not later than that. It's important the Gemara learns that the whole idea of zrizim akim and mitzvahs. The first chance you have to do a mitzvah, you should do a mitzvah. I'm assuming the baby is healthy. For every moment that you quote unquote push off the bris, you know, let's say the bris should be on a Wednesday, but you know what? Uh, it's more convenient, let's do it on a Sunday. You can't do that. Because each day the child doesn't have a bris is a violation of a negative commandment. The child has to have a bris. So, therefore, with very halacha dictates, a bris should always be done exactly when it needs to be done. But with Vosner at the same time dealt with, let's say you have a family which is not yet Torah observant. And the bris really should be on Shabbos. But you're afraid that the family will travel there on Shabbos. Or the family will take pictures on Shabbos. Even though we don't usually push off a bris, the Vosner, and he brought proofs to this, felt it's okay in this scenario to push it off because you're saving people from, from discretions, right? Saving people from desecrating Shabbos. <coughs> Now, it'll be better in this scenario. Of course, we don't push off a bris. But at the same time, there's a serum involved. So, in that case, we have to do that. We push it off to Sunday. He has a, another, which I thought was a very important idea of uh, balancing halacha. We know a person makes a bracha on something, <clears throat> let's say on a food. You make a bracha on a food. So right after you make a bracha, you should taste from that food. <coughs> Which Rabbi Sharfman just said, I was listening to a tape not too long ago. He said an important thing. People a lot of times do a little with somebody, right? Take a shot, just had a grandkid. <coughs> so you can make a shahako. Then you lift up your schnapps cup, you lift up your champagne glass, and you say l'chaim down the hatch. And you drink it. That word l'chayim that you said after you uttered the bracha was a hefsek, was a separation between your bracha and drinking the drink. You're not supposed to do that. So a person should always be planned out. L'chayim, then make the bracha, then drink. Really, they say the best time to give a person the bracha is after you've enjoyed the drink. That's when you give the bracha. But Either way, a person has to be careful not to be mafsek, not to have a pause or speak out between making a bracha and eating something. Let's say I make a bracha on a food, and then you realize, oh no, maybe there's a halachic question about this food and whether it's kosher or not. So what should one do? Now, if it's, okay, if it's mama's treif, you have a bag of potato chips, and then someone points, it says lard over here. <laughs> That's pig. It says pig. Mm. So, okay. No one's going to say by that case, okay, yeah, that's Dunsky. You can't eat pig. But the question is, what about something which is like a suffix in Allah? It's not for sure, not this. So maybe so my bracha shouldn't be in vain. Maybe I should have something. So again, the balance of halacha, where Vosner writes that no, you have to know how to balance these things, is if something is to any degree a suffix in halacha, he says, no, then you shouldn't eat it because you have to be careful about eating 
even more so than this. It's not considered a brothel atola because you're stopping from eating to protect Allah. Again, I think another instance of a balance. A third story or halacha I came across. Rabbi Zilberstein, uh, Rabbi Yashif's son in law, brother in law of uh, the big, he himself, big Rav in B'nai Brak, viewed Rav Osner as a tremendous, tremendous posse. Tells over a story that they had in B'nai Brak of some uh, Jewish person who wasn't at this point, or it sounds like he was at one point observant, but went and was no longer observant, but was inspired to be reinvolved. And he wanted to go and start putting on tefillin. Fine. They sent quickly, they had his tefillin checked, and they found out that the tefillin were not kosher. So the people who were involved with him felt it will take a few days to get him a new pair of tefillin. In the interim, if he doesn't put on tefillin, if he told him he can't put on these tefillin, he's, he's, he, he, he might lose it. He might be, forget it. Okay? He's got to do it right now. He's got to nip it in the bud. If right now he's inspired, you got to get it. You'll know what tomorrow might bring. So there's some advocating, maybe we should let him put it on. Because after all, he, a few days we'll get new partials, we'll fix it for him. But in the meantime, do it. Once again, Rav Osner understood the balance. Look, Allah is Allah. If right now it's not the right thing to do, right, he's going to put in the pair of tefillin, which is puzzle, right? So that would be an isa of lo sigara, that you shouldn't diminish any of the mitzvahs. You're putting on tefillin, which are not kosher. You're putting tefillin, which are puzzle. So you can't do it. Very, very interesting balance in Allah. Just as an aside, this same question was later asked to Chaim Tanyevsky. He came up with a very interesting sock. The Isser of Los Igara is if a person wears tefillin that has the parashios in them, which are puzzle. It does not apply if you put on a toy around <coughs> your arm. Chaim Tanyevsky said, why don't you take out the parashios from his tefillin? That he's putting on a toy. Obviously, you can't make a brach on it. But the iser is only if you wear puzzle, invalid tefillin. Here, this isn't tefillin, there's nothing in them. So, Chaim held in such a case, he could do that. Interesting, Psach Halacha. I'll tell you a couple other halachas. This one comes up here coming soon for Pesach. What do you do when it comes to Pesach in terms of your garbage bin? If there's chametz inside your green, black, whichever side of the neighborhood you live on, garbage bin, is that your responsibility? Depends on your municipality. So when Vlasner looks at this question, like a posting, I'll quickly read through it. It's on the top of your, on the first sheet all the way to the left. He writes the paragraph over there. He klia musker yezlo din chotzer. This rented. Right? This is not your, you don't own the garbage bin, right? Those are owned by the city. So, what rights the government? What rights do you have to that bin? Well, being the fact that you live there, you're a homeowner, so they give you permission to use it. So, that's like a renter. The way we view this object is you're renting it. <clears throat> but being the fact it's its own enclosed area, so it's like your chutzner. In a certain sense, it's like your backyard. And he starts quoting a chutzner on Musker Yishmach Lokas. 
a, ba- a yard which is rented out, who has a responsibility for it? Let's say I'd rent out my, my backyard, my pool for Pesach. Who's responsible for the chametz then? Is it the owner or the person renting it? So he says, that's machlokas. So these garbage bins, it's an enclosed area, it's like a chatzar, and it's rented. So who's responsible? The owner, which would be the municipality, or the renter, which would be you. So he quotes Nesivas. He says, it's a machlokas. He says, but that machlokas really is machlokas in terms of, let's say, finding a lost object. A lost object appeared in that backyard. Who has rights to it? Right? Some bandit, you know, is running away. You know, uh, he's being uh, chased by uh, by ice, and he throws uh, a bundle of uh, money into your backyard on Pesach when you rent it out to somebody else. <laughs> so who has rights to that money? Oh, yes. It's your backyard, but they're paying a rental fee. Sure. So the Gemara, so the Poles can have Mach Lokas. Don't the ownership go to the owner or the renter? So Revolza says, but that's that machlokas you find is in terms of a lost object. They were talking about garbage. He thinks that He says, sorry, Charlie. The, the municipality doesn't really want your garbage. It's all yours. They might have to, to get rid of it. But the stuff in there, this apparently doesn't own your garbage. It's your garbage. And you would be fully responsible for chametz in your camp. And... Why is it considered renting to the property? So I assume, I was thinking about that. Because the relationship you go into the city when they give you the can, it's like, oh, you're a nice borrower, you know, oh, I could use a, a can like that. No, it comes with the fact that you're a homeowner, that you're using the house, so you pay taxes. And they give you, part of what they do is they give it to you. So it's not just lending it to you, it's viewed really as a rental uh, relationship. So he continues. If you want a second can, they ask you for a fifty dollar deposit. So it's like the, not only do you have to someone ask you for the deposit, they ask you to pay for it. Or right. Just here, take it. Right. Excellent point. Right. You see, the whole thing is a financial relationship. Right. They ask us money for it. If it's a deposit, it's not a rental. If it's a deposit, right? If it's a deposit, they're saying they still own it, but they're letting us use it. Right. They want us to buy it. They say pay fifty dollars and you own it. Right. So we definitely we don't we don't own those garbage cans, but it's more of a rental that we have. They have responsibilities to bus, you know, take away our garbage. They let us use it. They let us use it. And yeah. Why is it considered a But hold on. <laughs> so he ends up saying like this. Look, if someone else. Let's say, you know, I live near a school. If some public school kid walked by my garbage can and threw in chametz on Pesach, am I responsible for that? So he says, no. That, I don't want to be kona it. It's not my responsibility. I'm off the hook. However, in general, this is your garbage can. And if there is some chametz in there, you would be responsible for it. So it's a very smart idea. Very simple, which is used by postcom all over. Is why don't you spray your garbage can before Pesach with some disinfectant, <coughs> which after that you ain't gonna want to eat the food in the garbage can. Well, yeah. No one else. You don't want to eat it anyway. <laughs> but this one you're yeah, fully no doing it. Yeah, but the dog has no problem. With it. Right. <laughs> and once you do that, nifso me achilas kelev. You just have to make sure that you get the comments that way. Right. It's right. not so simple. If you're, if you spray, you should spray it when there's nothing in it. Right. 
Because you spray the can and you have some yes. that's in a plastic bag that's wrapped yes. in tinfoil. Well, that's an idea. Yeah. 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 Ye
You have wonderful children who make you famous. Would you do it? And this young teenage girl sat and thought, and you know, she said, yeah, I'll take you up on it. Gave her a bracha. That's the story. This story was written over in the historical records of Vienna. And it said this Rachel Schiff got married and she had a son named Shmuel. It was none other than Shmuel of Rosner. She kept this story from her son for most of his life. She refused to tell him the story. As in, towards the end of his life, this story was revealed to him. And he says, now it makes sense. He says, my mother would never uh, say anything about it. All she would tell me is to learn well in yeshiva. And she said, you never know how much I gave up for you to be there. Amazing story. I'm sure his mother was with him to get into the Chachmei Lugdis Chos, to get into the yeshiva. His mother's Chos had to be with him when he's swimming to the shores of pre-state Palestine. <coughs> his mother's with him every step of the way for 102 years. Amazing, amazing story. Thank you for listening. Uh -huh.